Hello and welcome to Chats at Television Podcast Season 16, Couch Magnifa. Sixteen shows enter, one emerges as the show we will watch for the remainder of our season. Who will win? Who will lose? And who will die? My name is Magellan and... They're known to taxpayers everywhere as the accountant. They've got robot problems and bad. It's out. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hi. Good evening. We are so freaking back. It's time to talk about TV. I couldn't be more excited. Hi. Hi. Same. Same. Hi. Same. Can you say hi again? I love that like that tenor. Hi. Yeah. Hi. 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 <laughs> Oh, we're doing pirate Hold on, Let me just now? open my libretto real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Open your libretto. <laughs> I think that's like the book of a, libretto. of a musical. Or something. I don't think it's actually it the says It's a part. Dexter's Laboratory episode. Oh. Dynamite slash libretto. So we have the blue dog and have Dexter to create a new robot psychic. Sorry, we're both doing something. What were you saying? Yeah. <laughs> I was describing the plot of the libretto episode of Dexter's Lab. Oh. We Did can talk about TV libretto. now. Yeah, please. Dita, get out of my... There's so many bad jokes I can make about the libretto. The libretto tar pits. There it is. We're done. Uh, hey, guys. It's Magellan and Al. We're two best friends who love talking about TV. And in the usual season of chats, we do this uh, two episodes a week. And uh, this is Couch Madness. We're a little bit mad. We're afflicted with a sickness. And that sickness is indecision paralysis. Or decision paralysis, rather. <laughs> we made a big bracket, which you can find on Challenge, linked in the description of a bunch of shows that we want to watch and eventually decide on one that wins it all and uh, becomes the next show that we cover in a traditional chats format. So uh, we recommend going back to the first four rounds recorded before the SAG after and WGA strikes to hear our discussions of the previous contenders. Because tonight, in the ring, in this corner, an HBO television series about death, the death industry, and a family wrapped up in it at six feet under. Oh, man. So, Magellan. We, we started yeah. tonight by watching Six Feet Under's Pilot, which is, of course, called Pilot. This series was written and directed by Alan Ball, and it aired June 3rd, 2001. Now, if you're a Chats patron, you may remember mm. that Magellan and I have watched <laughs> the Six Feet Under pilot before. <laughs> tee hee hee. Pilot and, Chats. And that was on Pilot Chats 40, which was released on August 21st of 2021. Whew, um, crusty. A bit crusty. Yeah, I listened to it, and I'll be talking about it a little um, did you get a chance to listen to it back? I did. Yes. It's it's interesting, right? Isn't it weird hearing us like the way we talk about TV? I don't know. Uh, yeah. I, have thoughts. I have a lot of thoughts. I have a lot of thoughts. We've got thoughts. But first, Magellan, can you tell me what happens in the Six Feet Under pilot just for the folks, please? I would love to. Also, it's kind of fun that we're talking about this now in December because it's a Christmas episode, sort of. It of. is. Kind huh? of, yeah. It's set on Christmas Eve in the year 2000, and uh, here's what happens. Patriarch Nathaniel Fisher, played by Richard Jenkins, owner of Fisher & Sons Funeral Home, is struck and killed by a bus while driving his brand new hearse. His death throws his immediate family into emotional chaos as they attempt to deal with their grief. Nathaniel's death casts a pall over the return of his older son, Nate, played by Peter Krause, who's hoping for a relaxing vacation before returning to his home in Seattle. Uh, on the flight, uh, uh, there's uh, Brenda Chenoweth, played by Rachel Griffith. Uh, they have they sex. Have sex. And stuff. Um, dutiful son David, played by Michael C. Hall, is struggling mm. to keep his true sexual identity and his new boyfriend Keith, played by Matthew St. Patrick, from his family. Uh, matriarch Ruth, played by Francis Conroy, has her own secrets to keep, while youngest child and only daughter Claire, played by Lauren Ambrose, has her first taste of crystal meth before finding out about Nathaniel's death and must now go through the experience while high on crystal meth. Meanwhile, Nathaniel Specter repeatedly appears to each member of his family, forces them to face their own anxieties about life and death. You know, if I were uh, just doing a little copy editing on the Wikipedia summary here, I would say make, make them face their own anxieties about death and life. Mm, yeah, prioritize the one that, that is the focus. True. So without repeating myself from the pilot chats, which you should listen to by going to patreon.com slash chats, plug, plug, plug. I 
was excited to come back to Six Feet Under his pilot. I think it's a wonderful pilot. I think it does a great job of introducing not only the ensemble, but uh, like how they're each individually going to interact with each other. We get a lot of intercharacter interactions. Um, yep. It's more 2000s than I remembered. It's like very Aussie. Uh, mm. I did make the comment that it reminds me of Scrubs, especially in that final scene with Nate on the street. But like, mm -hmm. it really felt Scrubsy. Like, what if Scrubs was more serious with less, with like, you know, instead of 70 30 comedy drama, it's like 70 drama 30 comedy. Mm. How did you feel about it on this rewatch? Um, well, just to, you know, reiterate our opinion of it. Um, we were pretty, we felt pretty positive about Six Feet Under um, from yes. what I remembered and what I listened to on the episode. And uh, <clears throat> we watched it at a particular time in my life because uh, when we watched it in August of 2021, that was about five months after my stepdad passed away. He died in mm -hmm. March of 2021. And so for me, watching it at the time, um, I it was like... Uh, cathartic to watch a show that gives you so much permission to feel the full range of emotions in response to death um and so it like hit me at a time that i needed that show this show to like you know carry this message and revisiting it i think it's kind of impossible to recapture that specific context um and that closeness to a significant passing in my life um yeah i think i'm a little more settled now with my stepdad having passed away and uh i've also weirdly recently like a lot of my coworkers and people i know <clears throat> have had family members pass away um i recently learned about a student who i used to teach who passed away which was really sad, oh, that's so sad. um and so it's like Kind of another weird moment in my life where there's a lot of death around me, but my relationship to it is like very different from when it was the same kind of death that's happening to the characters in this show. Um, so I don't know. I think it was harder for me to connect to it this time, but I still appreciated it. And I also found myself identifying with different characters this time than I did the first time. Um, which was an interesting experience as a as a TV viewer. So um, it's still, I think, a really masterful pilot. Um, I think it strikes a pretty good balance between comedy and drama. I honestly found it a little too, like, <laughs> not slapstick, yeah. but like a little too funny, mm -hmm. actually. Um, so it's funny that you're comparing it to Scrubs because I, I do see that um, this on this viewing. But uh, but yeah, so I don't know if that if I even answered the question, <laughs> but I think I still liked it, but in a different way. Um, I also yeah, I got a more a little bit different things out, some different things out of it this time. I also related more to different people. Um, I think I had I had mentioned in that pilot chats like like, oh, they really nailed the realism of of Nate and his sister's like relationship because I have mm -hmm. a sibling myself and I understood that. But now it, it was almost like subconscious for me how much I related to Nate when he was like, Jesus Christ, I come back hoping for a vacation and eating my mom's food. And now there's all this stuff. And feeling this obligation to, like, fix things. Because especially the first year after I moved out, it was like, if I would stay home for more than a day or two, it started to feel like, not that I was, like, my family's therapist or anything like that, but, like, there was suddenly, like, work I had to do. Like, it was my obligation mm -hmm. to, like, mm -hmm. help mm -hmm. as if that was, like, something that was my responsibility. It was not. Um, and that's mm -hmm. something I've gotten better about. But, yeah, like, I just, I, I felt a little bit differently about it. I have not experienced, thank, thank God, that much more death. And I think the show maybe felt extra relevant like for both of us just during covid even like at separate from right yeah we did yeah. talk about covid in that pilot show mm -hmm. like separate from what our families are going through but i think like end of the day right now it's funny i can like see and understand the comedy more and i can also see the holes in it more i'm not as wowed by as i was the first time it's like okay this is what watching six feet under is like and be like on a weekly basis because mm -hmm. I think, like, you know, you act, like I, I had mentioned that the reason I initially picked that for Pilot Chats was, like, actors were like this show. Zach Braff from, from Fake Doctors and from Scrubs actually really loves this show. He said it's the best setting he's ever seen in a television show. And mm -hmm. I think actors like it because it gives its characters a lot of room to be 
both realistic and actory, if that makes sense. Yeah, right, right. Like it's not um what did I watch? Oh, I've been watching The Curse recently. Um I'm going to talk about that more later, and that is a very like uh it's like, like a cinema verite style show, it's documentary style. Uh-huh. And in that it, it's uncomfortable because it feels very real. I don't uh-huh. think that the people in 60 under necessarily act and speak the way real people do. They speak like written television characters. Um, totally. Totally. Something I noticed much, much more in this, this watch was like, like, Oh, these are lines. This is a monologue you're being given. You are doing acting. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, and whether that's good or bad, like, I think that also just answers a question I had in that pilot of like, like, how does this go on for five seasons? And the answer is, like, when you put an ensemble together like this and give them high drama to deal with, there's always going to be something. Right. Um, there was a lot of stones left unturned in this pilot that I was like, oh, that's probably going to come back. Like, I don't think I even put together that, um, I think his name is Rico, the guy who works in the morgue. Mm-hmm. He's, like, a major character uh, yeah. with, like, an arc that people care about. A lot of people don't like Rico. He's, he's, he's mm-hmm. like, the annoying character i guess which sure. means we're, we're yeah. probably gonna love him and think he's perfect because you know how this works <laughs> um or like brenda which i i could tell watching this like brenda's gonna be a person because they wouldn't give a woman sorry to say it's the 2000s they wouldn't give a woman this many lines unless she was important to the story uh-huh. um especially not a woman whose whole entire role is to be a like sexually interested person uh mm-hmm. i really it rubbed me a little bit wrong the first time it really rubbed me poorly this time how much she talks about sex with with uh with what with Nate? I was like, Ugh. Mm-hmm. so written by a man. Uh, and that's like obviously, obviously, we're sex positive here in chats. Women and men, all everyone can be sexual, but like it just felt like it was a different show. You know what I mean? It felt very yeah HBO pejorative. Totally. Yeah, I felt the exact same thing. I think you expressed it really well. That it's like this is a very written show honestly the thing that um feels most closely in tone in that kind of tone to it that we've watched is angels in america i think yeah yeah it's like oh this is a play you know like yep these are real people this is like a grounded scenario that real people experienced and then we're kind of adding a bit of the fantastical on top of it and making these people speak in like the most emotionally expressive, most charming, intelligent version of who they are. And it was interesting feeling that way this time because the first time around, that was not something that struck me about the show. I really, I think, felt like the characters were, I don't know if I felt they were realistic, but I had like a gratitude for that kind of emotional clarity and honesty. And this time around, it it was kind of like, okay, I get it. This is you're this kind of character and you're having a big moment of this particular emotion. Yeah. Um and uh there are other things that you said that I wanted to <laughs> I said a lot to. of things. <laughs> to be uh, fair. Talking about women being women writing women? Well, yeah, I also was bothered by the HBO ness of it. Um and really like really turned off by the Nate character this time around uh i wasn't a huge fan interesting yeah yeah we we had a conversation in our pilot chest where we were like um you know relating to his sort of oh i live in a apartment that was supposed to be temporary with a job that was supposed to be temporary and i don't know where my life's yeah yeah that i'm 35 and uh, i'm gonna die alone and all that and uh at least for myself my life is just in a different place than it was in 2021 and so Uh i don't have that same kind of um cynicism about my own life um i think i still feel some of that like where am i going or what is it all going to mean sort of a thing but Mm -hmm. uh this time around i i was not super into him i was really bothered by the brenda stuff and like we're Mm -hmm. having sex in an airport and you know what is this going to be and she's like married and that's a whole thing that we're doing um it just you know who i related like to more in this tangential. one and... i related to are you gonna say david because I, I related to david more yes absolutely yeah, yes 100%. i knew you were gonna say too <laughs> it's just 
it, it really it really says a lot about what part of your life you're in whether or not you relate more to nate or david because they kind of represent opposite sides of like how you approach family and your career right because nate is like i left so that i could do better because this family was too much for me and coming back is unearthing a lot of trauma for me and david is like i'm the only thing holding this together and by me staying here Mm -hmm. We are able to continue loving and working together. And it, it relies on me like this sort of holy duty mm -hmm. um, that he doesn't want to be clear. Like he feels burdened by it. Right. He has mm -hmm. that scene where uh, and I felt really weird about these like interstitial joke cuts this time. But like where the woman at the funeral is like, you're going to be here forever because people like me are all you're going to see now that you work here and your dad mm -hmm. is dead. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt like, yeah, but I still felt a companionship with David. And also as being a closeted queer person, I thought. I mean, hey, maybe it's just because I remembered that, but at the first five minutes of the episode, when the mom is, like, stressing about the husband, and she's like, oh, uh, like, wait, what is he, cheating on me? Wait, is he gay? God forbid. And you can totally see David be, like, Ugh! like, kind of uh, wince a little bit. Uh, Did not catch that the first time. Probably should have in hindsight. Um, uh, but, like, they're giving David stuff to do. I know, like, people in our Discord feel very mixed about Michael C. Hall. I'm not a Dexter fan at all. I didn't. What I've seen of Dexter, I don't even like him in it. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think he plays like gruff and grumpy in that show a lot uh -huh. uh, and weird. But in this, he's like a little bit more tender and a character that we can empathize with. So, you know, in terms of characters I liked, I definitely came out of it a David Stan and a Rico Stan, obviously. Yeah, I um, I related a lot more strongly to this character who's like, I have a duty to other people. Uh, I like the whole monologue that he has where he's talking to his boyfriend and he says uh his boyfriend's like you're gonna get through this and he's like of course i am because i have to like i exactly. have to be steady for everybody i have to do this i have to give i have to give i have to give mm -hmm. and i related to that sentiment and also to the the twist of that where it's like maybe he has like an inaccurate perception of other people's capability to like take care of themselves or be steady or he's like always putting himself in the position of the caretaker or the like the rock or whatever without making space for himself um yeah that's something that i i related to a lot more this time around um and to see him like in that scene where nate's at the funeral and he's like come on let's throw the fucking dirt and sob on the coffin I was like, dude, you're being a dick right now. Yeah. Like, okay, cool. You went to Europe and now you have an opinion of the right way to do this. But like <laughs> we have procedures and customs and rituals, not necessarily because they're like the best possible way to do it, but because people can like expect them and move through them and know how to operate mm -hmm. and don't have mm -hmm. to be pressured to express themselves or feel something in a space or context where they're not comfortable. So I don't know. I was like much more on David's side this time around, which I think is the mark of a well-written show. This works. Yeah. Um, so that, that was kind of where I went with it this time around. Yeah. Just like immediately when I was watching this, I was like, that's unacceptable. And sure. Nate is technically right. These rituals are, silly and they come from some like kind of maybe messed up places and they don't make a lot of sense from the outside but like you said Michelle, you said it so well there they are predictable so much of the death and grieving process is unpredictable and sad and confusing and like at least we can rely on a coffin being lowered into the ground and at least we can rely on the salt thing the, sh the shakers the, the dirt shakers like mm -hmm. we need things like that and and for nate to be like this is ridiculous and it's my job to tell the family that this has always been ridiculous. It's like, D Doc, who are you? Who and again, right. like, <clears throat> it feels like the scales came off my eyes a little bit when he's like, oh, I went to Sicily and I saw these people and they know how to grieve. And I was like, the hell are you? What do you say? You're you're that guy who's like, I went to Europe and I know how the world works now. Mm -hmm. it, it really was not clear to me on the first viewing, and now I was fully on like, the more we hear Nate fighting with David in this episode, the more I'm like, Ugh. yeah. But it's like, you know. That's what Nate's mom needed. Like she needed the permission to to wail, and that's yeah. kind of what I needed at the time that we watched it. So mm -hmm. you need different people, or like the same person needs different things at different times. So absolutely, think, you should like, have space for both. I think that's what makes that such a powerful scene, and mm -hmm. what makes this pilot so engaging is like 
these characters have big feelings and big opinions about things that you have big feelings and big opinions about. And there isn't yeah. a right answer. Um, but we're going to sort of like fling these worldviews at each other and see what comes out of that conflict. And that's a show I'm willing to watch, right? Like that's a show of different uh -huh. worldviews coming into contact with each other in different weird ways that I'm like, yeah, I can watch a whole bunch of that and like get into it and argue who's right and who's wrong in each situation. Uh -huh. I wish that one of the main characters wasn't dating a police officer, uh, especially if the show's yeah, one that's... queer character. <laughs> That's not fun. No, <laughs> and un that. no, it's not. And it, what it does in this episode, it's so convenient that when they're like, "Who is this? Why are you here? And why?" And then the mom is like, "Why is there a cop here?" And he's like, uh, "Oh no, he's just checking it out. He's just you know here to pay his respects." And I was like, "What? No." <laughs> and uh, I think it's Claire who's immediately like, "That's pro in her head." She doesn't say it, but she like clocks she them immediately. Yeah, right, right. Which I appreciate. Um, yeah. I feel really mixed about Claire. I think Lauren Ambrose does a fine job uh -huh. with the grief and her conversations with Nate are fantastic. But like, how much is the drug stuff going to come up? You think in this show? Yeah, it, that felt, there were a couple things that felt a little Looney Tunes to me in this episode. One of them was like, let's have sex in the airport, which I, I get it. Like I get that you need to get these characters to form a connection quickly. You need to show that both of them are like, searching for love in the wrong places and aren't in touch with themselves or whatever uh -huh. and you need to make it complicated right away sure but like it's looney tunes that we're gonna find the little closet in the airport and do the thing and it's looney tunes that <laughs> claire is like what the heck i'm on crack and the guy's like no nah, it's crystal meth <laughs> like silly silly you could have just made her high she was just high smoking weed and oh my god my dad's dead and i'm high and that would have been just as good of a plot i um, imagine they wrote it like that and then tweaked it because they wanted the line of like you know worst experience of my life and it's heightened because of dr like specifically the when the eric right, Balfour like character drug or whatever sure. when, when the eric Balfour character is like you're gonna feel everything so much stronger like sex and she's like and grief you dick Right. And, like, weed wouldn't make you feel that stronger, necessarily. But, like, right, right. crystal meth? Like, you, whoa. <laughs> Wowie. Uh, yeah. yeah, so what else, What other notes do you have about the episode? What else did you want to talk about? Um, Let's see. <clears throat> it was funny to me that we, by the way, just the last thing I'll say about our Pilot Chats episode, we did a SWAT analysis of... Wild. <laughs> Which is just like extremely, you're in business school. I'm in business school, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so funny. Yeah. So funny. Um, yeah, let's see. Da, 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 da. I I found the dad stuff pretty engaging. I think what I'm struggling with with this show right now is like, what does more of it look like? Because yeah. uh, a show that hits a similar vibe that we also piloted um, in the past year or so was uh, The Sopranos. And I watched The Sopranos pilot, and I can understand what more Sopranos probably looks like. Yeah. Like, everybody's a little fucked up. We got a tough dynamic. And also there's, like, you know, mafia stuff. And we can do a little bit of that to get some plot in there. Uh-huh. Um, and this is, like, essentially the setup to a sitcom, it feels yes. like. A workplace be sitcom. Because we are a family who's going to run the funeral home and it's going to be a new death every week, and we're going to deal with that. Um, so it feels like, is this the most serious episode for a while? Because um, <laughs> you can't kill their dad every week. At a certain point, we're going to do a lot of those scenes that you were describing not loving, where it's like, here's a wacky, you know, um, what's the word? Like a customer? Why did I have a client hard time coming up with client? I think that was the word I wanted. Um, yeah, here's a wacky client or here's a wacky relative. And we're going to kind of do a tongue in cheek version of a real thing. So I'm wondering what the week to week looks like. And I think the real engine of it is like them talking to their own versions of their dad. Um, and those scenes were all pretty engaging to me. I like how much of an asshole he is. But he's like a different asshole for everybody. Yeah. Um, 
So, so I'm intrigued, but I'm a little skeptical about how does this turn into six seasons or whatever it is. Well, yeah, I think it's going to – like, stuff's just going to happen to them. And I think that, weirdly, even though we're being, a, like, a decent, decently negative about this, I – almost feel more compelled to give it one more episode now because i want to see what a normal because this episode has like the commercials and the plot set up and like you know the commercials like the little in universe ads for funeral supplies which we love um like what does a totally normal episode of 16 under look like because you know valid concerns i've seen from like listeners and from reading online are like I don't always agree or feel like the characters decisions are realistic uh they mm -hmm. don't use richard jenkins enough which that complaint is confusing to me because you can only use a ghost so much. He's basically a main. I've looked it up. He's in like 18 episodes of the show or something. Like he's not oh. not in the show. Okay, I thought he was going to be in like every episode. Yeah, I, I, I and I think that, that would make sense for sure. I would have liked that, but they just it's tough to keep bringing that in without people eventually being like, "Hey, are you okay? Why are you talking to that eye, that wall or whatever?" Like, yeah, I like Richard Jenkins a lot and want to see him in more stuff, but I think that from what I've seen, that's a good amount of him to be in the show. Mm -hmm. Um, so like, I'm just curious, really. I'm really curious what because I don't want to just simply close the book on a show that has been re well, really, really well regarded and like people love the show. And yeah, is one episode right. enough to say that you got it? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think I wonder from the perspective. I mean, this is getting into like second half of the episode stuff, but yeah, from the perspective of what's the discussion to be had, because it feels like this pilot does a pretty good job of like giving me the full range of opinions about death and grief. It gives me a lot to chew on and think about and revisit and change my mind on. And I don't know how you stretch that over time without having to, like, invent drama. Like, that's a big yes. reason why I didn't love the Brenda stuff. Yes. Because it feels like, well, we also need to have some plot. So we're going to, like, plant the seeds of some plot here. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. um so i don't know i i'm also interested if i was watching this pilot you know just as a normal tv viewer instead of a little goblin who has a podcast <laughs> um i would have watched episode two because it's like yeah. that was really good let me watch more a little more um i probably would have watched episode two you know two years ago or whatever and be done with yeah. the show by now mm -hmm. um but I'm a little goblin with a podcast, so. <laughs> and I love that about you. And you. I would like to watch. Well, let's 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 save that discussion for part two. Yeah. But, um, I have some more. I have some more quick hits from this one. Yeah. Uh, I did like Ruth, the mother's comment about Rico's hands. She said, "Oh, you have such soft hands." Mm -hmm. While he's like cleaning a corpse out, that's fantastic. I love gallows humor, and I think the show is mm -hmm. full of it. Mm -hmm. Um, I commented on this in the pilot chats, but I really want to underline how funny Peter Krause's delivery is when he's talking to Claire at the funeral and another woman is like, oh, your father's in a better place. And he just goes, you're so right about that. He, like, <laughs> just he yells it at her, which I, uh -huh. I, I wanted to underline. Uh, I mentioned the unfortunate cop thing. Uh, did you catch the guy who was trying to sell them on, like, getting their funeral home bought out? Did you catch that? Yeah. Cameo? I, I don't know if I caught that. We didn't really talk about that in the pilot chats, but that's also some no. some plot, I guess. Yeah, so that definitely is going to be something. Craner is the company, Croner, and they want to mm. buy them out, and they're like, no, F you. And it's like, that's obviously going to be a plot. The actor who does that is Gary Hirschberger, who plays Mike Nelson in Twin Peaks and Twin Peaks The Return. Oh! Mike Nelson, <laughs> Bobby's friend. Bobby's and friend. <laughs> And I think he's even in Fire Walk with me. He's like been he's the Twin Peaks guy. Uh, so okay, well that's kind pretty of cool. Yeah, I hope that there's some more cameos like that where I'm like, oh, that guy in in Six Feet Under. But mm -hmm. I just don't know, right? Like I, I weirdly the other show I thought of in regards to this was The OC, where it's like here's sure, an ensemble, sure. here's a here's a setup. What's gonna happen? Let's just throw some problems at the cast. And the sure. reason I'm more compelled by The OC is it's not trying to be like a highly serious thought-provoking drama whereas right. like 600 seems like it's going to attempt to tackle some of that like also i've been thinking yeah. about the oc because seven wall just put out his new book welcome to the oc which i've been reading it's really good he did like a deep dive oral history of that show yeah um it's my soft chats them for my the other alan who's in television uh <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Anyways, my rival. My rival. Freaking, I'll never not be annoyed that uh, Too Long Didn't Watch was a podcast idea that he came up with before we made it a thing. And then he like, stopped doing it. And then Come he on. Stopped doing it. Well, it was such a COVID. Sh- like, you are never going to. I thought about this recently. You're never going to yeah. get that many celebrities to just get on a video a call with you and watch shows with you unless it's COVID and they're not working. It just won't ever happen again. But. Right. You know, unique time and place. Um, any other thoughts on 16 Under before we move on? Let me do some quick, quick hits, quick hits, quick hits. Popcorn notes, as they say on Austin Danger. Alan Ball, creator, of the third Alan in television, creator of <laughs> 16 Under, also created True Blood, which makes me think, in 2024, we got to just do a Pilot Chats run of all these, like, witchy, vampire-y, freaking... Like, let's do all of our eldritch pilots yeah. in 2024. You know, our, our Supernatural, <laughs> our Charmed, our Sabrina, the original and the new one. Let's do it all. Um, I think of more. I love that idea. Also, we have so many guests who would require that they be on for those. The Vampire <laughs> Diaries. Oh, God. <sighs> Every that version be... of, uh, what's it called? Be- being Human. Oh, Yeah. I'll both both oh, two or three versions. I thought it was only two. Discovery of witches. Are you googling Others. right now? I can tell. No, I'm not. Those are all off the dorm. The dorm. Okay. The dorm. The dorm. The dorm. Off the dorm. Off the dorm. Off the dorm. Off the dorm. Stop. What else? What else? What else? What else? No, I got oh. you. I got you. Oh, good. I got you, and I agree with you that we should do that. Yeah. Um, observation that I had this time around. Uh, it's fun to set a show about death uh, amongst people who work at a funeral home to make it clear, like, nobody's ready for this. You could, Yeah, even people who live it. You could live this and still. Because the mom at one point is like, look, looking at dead people is my job. I cannot see your father dead because that would yeah. be, like, my job. I can't right. do that. That's a good point. Um, I also just realized I really love stories about adult siblings yeah i love, I love that's an adult sibling, sibling. i'm like mm, more of this please yeah we don't do enough adult sibling stuff i agree great movie about adult siblings the skeleton twins oh oh i'm not familiar with it oh that's the bill Hader, kristen wig one. Oh wow i look at the poster and i immediately it's am taken so back so good so good. really okay all yeah. thoughts on the letterbox so funny and cute and so much pathos Craig Johnson. Who what have you directed, Craig? Craig. 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 Um, All right, let's... I, I like Nate trying to describe his family to Brenda and saying, my mother's a control freak. My brother, well, he's a control freak, too. It's like he really, that's his worldview, is everybody around him is a control freak. Yes. Um, anyway. Surround by control. You gave the Skeleton Twins three and a half stars on Letterboxd. That's not enough for a recommendation. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Three and a half <laughs> stars is like, that was pretty good. Yeah, okay. I got you. To get a four four stars, it has to be a good movie. Uh, yes. Three and a half to me is like, this is a niche recommendation. I'm recommending yeah. it to you because we just talked about how we love adult sibling stories. Adult sibling. Right. This That's but, great in the adult sibling genre, but it's pretty good in the movie genre. A four is like, I would feel safe just generally recommending this. Uh-huh. Yeah. Fair enough. Just to get into my letterboxed, uh, you know, methodology. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's freaking what's it called. Yep, that's freaking what's it called. We'll be back with whatever the fuck. That's six feet under. <laughs> we'll be right back to talk about. All I don't think three... we leave. I think we stay. Oh, we're not going anywhere. We don't take a break. Don't we leave after we talk about the second? Oh one? God, you mean the second, the third, and the fourth one? <laughs> yeah, I think we stay. We're gonna rapid fire these. So it's the it's the tick. talk about the tick 
The Thank tickles you for the are number. Point, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> the tickles are number two seed. Yes, but I I made a bit of an oopsie. And I forgot that there's more than one tick because I don't think I knew it. I only knew that there was the one, the guy, big guy. Patrick Warburton. Patrick the Warburton. One. That was the one that I you knew. You didn't know there was a cartoon? Tick. I don't think so. Wow. I don't think I knew there was a cartoon. I didn't even know it was like a comic. All oh I knew God. was the Patrick Warburton show where he's a big blue tick. And so I learned a bit more. And there's three ticks. So we watched the pilot of all three. Mm-hmm. We watched the first episode of the 1994 cartoon, The Tick versus the Idea Men, which was written by Ben Edlund, the creator of the character, The Tick, um, and Richard Liebman Smith, directed by Sue Peters, John Kafka, and Russell Mooney, uh, aired on September 10, 1994. We also watched the pilot episode of The Tick 2001, which was written by Ben Edlund, creator of The Tick, and directed by Barry Sonnenfeld, aired on November 8, 2001. And we watched the pilot of the Amazon original series, The Tick, 2016, which was called Pilot, written by Ben Edlin, creator of The Tick, directed by Wally Pfister, and that aired on August 18th, 2016. Now, Ben Edlin, here's a fun fact for you. Yes. Writer and director of Smile Time, the angel episode with the puppets. Ooh. Um, Great episode. Yeah, Ben Edlund, he's a Massachusetts boy. Okay? Yes, sir. I'm not going to say how close he is to where we grew up, but he's close to where we grew, where we grew up, kind of. Yes. Uh, kind of like, you know, one of these guys is drawing stuff, and it's kind of funny, but kind of whatever. Look, I'm not going to make assumptions. I just think we would have been friends. <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably. I, and I don't know if Ben Edlund is, like, shitty or something, um, but I'm assuming not just to assume the best. Uh, but you know, he was kind of in like the Joss Whedon stable sphere yeah. of people, which is why I'm, he's got a bit of the ick on him, unfortunately. Uh-huh. Um, but he wrote on angel. He wrote on firefly. He created some of the characters for Dr. Horrible sing along blog. So like bad horse ever heard of him. That's nope. a Ben Edlin character. No. Bad horse, bad horse, bad horse, bad horse. The evil league of evil. Anyway. Wow, that's in your guy. brain, dude. Did you just rewatch that recently or what? No, I love Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog. So curious uh, if it holds up. There's no way it does. No, but definitely not. It definitely I loved doesn't it. Hold up, but I loved it. <laughs> anyway, so the tick. That was from the um, previous uh, strike, by the way. That's why Dr. Horrible existed. Because of the uh, last writer strike. Yeah. We should have watched it. It's Oops. okay. We'll do it on the we next We couldn't. Strike. It was struck work. Oh, that's funny. Just because it comes from a strike doesn't mean it's not struck work. That's funny. Anyway, wh- were you familiar with The Tick before before this? So, yes. the My local comic store, New England Comics, was a, com- a place that Ben Edlund frequented a lot. So, a lot of New England Comics will use The Tick as their mascot uh, mm-hmm. And we'll also be like, we have Tick Comic here. So I always saw it. I'm sure they talked about it on Major Spoilers back in the day a little bit or referenced it. So I was definitely very, very aware of the character of the Tick. And I always assumed that it was what it is, which is like an arrogant but invincible funny character. Because um, uh-huh. he's like a Tick. He's indestructible, whatever. Uh, and he bounces. He's got a lot of energy. I just didn't know specifically what it was. But I have a lot of friends who said the cartoon is one of their favorites of the 90s. It's very well regarded. Mm-hmm. And in doing some reading, I learned, I was like, why does the Tech 2001, for example, look and feel the way it does? Like, why does it feel so high budget for a costume character show? Yeah. And you mentioned director Barry Sonnenfeld, which, you know, avid listeners and avid film people will know. Do you know what Barry Sonnenfeld worked on, dog? What's so that? many things. The Men, in, he directed the Men in Black movies. Oh, this feels like a men in black thing exactly wow exactly who knew barry sonnenfeld was an auteur he's absolutely an auteur he were he produced wild wild west an incredible cinematic thing that movie is really weird so he's worked on a lot of like live action he was ep on pushing daisies so like live action cg Uh, heavy shows um okay okay so that's all the stuff i came into this knowing was like Ben Edlund, Massachusetts native. People here love The Tick, I guess. I never really got into it. He did crossovers with other characters, mm-hmm. and people liked the cartoon. I knew nothing about the 2016 one, and I knew the 2001 one existed because people love um, 
uh, Patrick Warburton, and that's like a, a seminal Patrick Warburton thing. But otherwise, uh, I don't know shit about shit. <laughs> This was such an interesting exercise in ad- watching how things can get adapted differently. Yeah. I, I wish every show we piloted had three versions and we could watch all three pilots back to back. It was fascinating. It really was. It goes to show how much a simple premise can be manipulated and bent to match the desires of the audience at the time. Like yes. mid nineties, early two thousands, mid twenty tens. Those are three yeah. very, very, very different demographics of, of mm-hmm. TV watchers, and it really shows, like, in how earnest they, they're, they're pulling different sliders. How earnest is this one? How self aware is it? How uh, you know, sexual is it? How CG heavy is it? Um, mm-hmm. All those different sliders get pulled up and down for these three. And you feel like you have, these are almost like a textbook example of the different ways you can adapt a show and like in different eras of time. Um, yeah. So, so interesting. Um, I want to ask you first, which one was your favorite? Which one did you enjoy the most? <sighs> interesting question. I, I think the other thing to say to what you were describing there is it's also specifically uh, a good way of looking at superhero stories and what's sort of in vogue in these yeah. different eras because the tick is a character who exists to satirize superhero media right yes. Yes. um and that satire is obviously responsive to whatever superhero media looks like at the time so you have the 90s show that kind of feels like a riff on the 90s x-men show or like the the what's that called the timiverse the you know the dc animated Verse stuff tim yeah um it kind of feels like it's maybe responding to some of that too i don't know um then you've got the tick 2001 which is kind of like well we're gonna wear big dumb suits and plastic and look like the you know the brian singer x-men movies and stuff um or look like these kinds of uh speculative fiction action movies from the turn of the the millennium like men in black um or you've got the 2016 show which looks like a freaking marvel movie it's so weird um and narratively it's doing something way different i found the 2016 one to be the most interesting to discuss and Uh like probably the worst of the yeah 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 there you go (laughs) (laughs) Um, if you don't say this i'm gonna say it but thank you and then the it was hard to choose between the cartoon and the 2001 one which one would be my favorite but i think probably the 2001 one just because i'm charmed by the crust of 2001 stuff and like so weird all the weird humor feels very like you know snl episodes from that time period the thing we talk about all the time where it's like oh that's so gay but it's okay to be gay like that kind of comedy yeah lesbians (laughs) so um so that it felt like coming home a little bit i think probably the tick 94 holds up the best yeah um but i was charmed by the 2001 version for sure yeah i think yeah i agreed there personally i actually enjoyed the 94 one the most because the pacing of the jokes is bonkers man like when we went to um spoons tunes and booze uh, a few weeks ago it was mm-hmm. like oh wow old cartoons used to be so funny like i thought that when watching powerpuff girls which is like you know a couple years later but like it is just jokes 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 and most of them hit right like most of them are just like consistent this the satire is here i get it it's a pretty straight uh-huh. adaptation of the comic from what i hear also the 2001 one is just so profoundly weird. It's the most canceled show I've ever seen. And I watched on the air. <laughs> yes. So canceled. <laughs> it's just like you look at this and you're like, oh, no, this looks expensive and for no reason. Uh Oh, this is going to yeah. get canceled in five minutes. We got a comment, yeah. actually, from uh, from front of the pod, Ryan, about that, which I wanted to bring up really quickly. So he said okay. a thing about the, the Warburton version of the tick. That's important to consider is the context of why it never had a chance. Um, so this show came out right after 9-11 and on a network that's known for destroying mm. genre shows. Do we know what network the Tick 2001 came Fox. on? It's on Fox. Oh, I mean, yeah, there you go. Half of 13 under 13. Yeah. That being said, as a fan of the series, I've always wondered if it could have sustained for a long period of time. It was a show that was very perfectly throwing back to a style and era of comedy that wasn't viable anymore. 
but it does the uh-huh. Adam West Batman stuff super well. Um, right. And then he, he gets into his question, which is sort of existential. A big thing about all the versions of the tick that stumps me as a fan is what is the overall point? Mm-hmm. What are mm-hmm. we doing, Guillermo John? What's the appeal? Now that you've seen three pilots of the tick, uh, well, actually, sorry, briefly, I'll just say I thought the 2016 one was not at all what I expected, and then suddenly became exactly what I expected in a way that annoyed me. But I was like, this is uh-huh. actually in- interesting. But fuck yeah. you for making this. Like, I'm mad that this exists, but also I want to watch it. Yeah. Um, what's the point of the tick, man? He's got big muscles. He wears blue. He's got funny little uh, antenna. Look, uh, I'm going to start by answering this question from the perspective of somebody who accidentally made a tick himself, which uh, <laughs> deep cut listeners of the Patreon may remember um, a few years ago for Christmas time, we did uh, the 12 Days of Chatsmas, where yes. we put out like random audio bits and bobbles. And one of them was uh, like an audio uh, script I had written called Buff Croc Saves. And so the yeah. idea is like, it's going to be this audio drama series about like an extremely buff, super heroic crocodile who's also very like erudite and doesn't want to be seen as, you know, buff. He just wants to like be croc, and, but he's still going to save different stuff. So a little bit of a different character from The Tick. But the same sort of vibe of like, yeah, I want to do a superhero, but I want to kind of do it funny. That would be Uh, fun. And all of that is to say, I I don't know what the point of the tick is. I think it's just to have a little bit of fun. But um, it is interesting that the Adam West thing, because it feels like all of these versions of the tick, even if they're being responsive to the most popular form of superhero media of the time, they're trying to carry forward a spoof of that. And the further you get away from Adam West's Batman, the weirder it is to be spoofing it. Like when Peter Serafinowicz is calling um, Arthur Chum in 2016. Yeah. yeah. You're saying, what are you, huh? why are you doing this spoof? So, so I don't know. I think it's, it's just entertaining to see a character i don't know i think it comes down to arthur arthur being this normal guy right who's buying into the super heroic myth and seeing it as something that can be both you know exciting and also something that's like a bit vapid and narcissistic and having to navigate that um and the tick is representative of like the best and the worst of why we make superheroes and what they mean to us. So what is the tick for? I think it's for looking at what are superheroes for. Um, right. That's my thought on it anyway. Yeah, I think that's a great point. We didn't talk about him yet, but the tick has a sidekick, the moth, a.k.a. Arthur, um, who is just wonderful in every adaptation. I fell in love with him. I ship him in the tick, obviously. It's right there, especially in the 2001 one. Uh, but even in the 90s one, I felt a little bit of like, ooh, there's like an affection here. There is a moment in the 2001 one that really sold me on Arthur and actually like raised my opinion of the, the 01 tick which was right towards the end when, uh, you know, everything's like going, you know, we figure everything out and, oh no, there's a new issue. Uh, and Arthur is like, I guess I'm done for the day. And then Tick is like, come on, Arthur, I need you. And Arthur is so excited to be there. He's like, there's a, like, there's an Arthur shaped hole there waiting for you to fill. And for Arthur to feel needed in that moment and the Tick to fill that need was like so sweet and nice. And it's like, I totally see why you love this guy. Even just, like, as a colleague, like, not necessarily romantically, but, like, the Tick doesn't seem like he needs you because he's so powerful and charismatic and you're just a dude. But, like, I totally get it. The Tick needs a normal guy. He likes that Arthur is normal. And that mm-hmm. is, that is to me, what the point of the Tick is. It's the relationship between mm-hmm. Arthur and the Tick is, like, just something I go gaga over. Like, this this character that doesn't feel needed until he does. And the Tick, as somebody who... We've all met somebody, not to say that we've met someone like the Tick. I know I'm being silly there, (laughs) but like we've all met somebody whose life feels like it's already on its perfect little path and they're doing their thing and you just want to be a part of it for one day and you get invited to a party of theirs or they invite you to like go hang out and you're like, you are like the sweetest, coolest person. And the fact that you think about me means a lot. That is, that Mm -hmm. is how I feel between 
between Arthur and the Tick. Um, and I think that's highlighted best in the O1 version, but and mm-hmm. it is entirely flipped on its head in the 2016 version mm-hmm. um, in some interesting ways. Yeah. Should we not beat around anymore? Can we just like talk about why the 2016 what? one is bananas? Uh, yeah, well, do you want to talk about each version sequentially, or do you want to go there first? Well, I guess... Um, I just was gonna say that the 2016 tick is a, is a it's not a straight adaptation. It is a um, what is that called when it's doing the thing but it's not doing the thing? Like a reimagining or whatever. Yeah, you... kind of. But no, we can we can just go like you just give me some quick hits going well, down the yeah, line. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the gist is like the 1994 version is a pretty straight across the plate. Like it's a superhero cartoon, and here are the superheroes, and they're gonna do cartoon stuff. 2001 version is. Let's take that, make it live action, make it make a little more sense from like a character motivation standpoint, because now they're real life human beings that you have to look at and real life yep. actors who are emoting with their whole face and body. Um, and then the 2016 version is, OK, but what if we did this as like kind of a gritty superhero origin story movie? And I can't tell if it's a joke or what, mm-hmm. but we'll get to it. Uh, um but let's talk about 94 first um yes so the tick versus the idea man uh you want to give us the description of uh the summary of this one yeah in this episode the tick moves to the city and meets arthur convincing him to become his partner in the battle against evil straight down the plate this is really funny this is a funny ass cartoon to me we are i agree I, I bolded several jokes, uh, even in my very short series of notes, and I put at the end, this if we did this as the podcast, it would basically be us quoting jokes at each other and laughing about mm-hmm. it like idiots, mm-hmm. which is fine. But, like, yeah. you've got the tick. He's kind of funny. He's got a little bit of, like, I don't know how to get a real job, so I just do superhero stuff. This is fun for me. We get a ton of superhero parodies, and then we get the idea men who are these, again, very relatable like broke guys who wear masks uh-huh. but they can't you can't hear them that's a joke that they do a lot it's just rapid fire it's like you know a cartoon for the saturday morning like i'm eating sugary cereal generation <laughs> just yes. go throw jokes at me yeah yeah it it's funny that you mentioned spoons tunes and booze earlier it feels like that's a you know thing you can go to the movie theater watch cartoons at the movies and it feels like a perfect cartoon for specifically that get a bunch of millennials Yes. into into like a bushy movie theater on a weekend morning fill them up with booze and cereal and together we can all watch the tick 94 and uh-huh. laugh our asses off um like i guess this was a kids show but it feels like it was made for 30 year old like adult <laughs> children to watch um and i love yeah i just it's got that jank of the 90s x-men show but it's clever and has a lot of like intentionally very funny lines. What what were your favorite jokes? Let's just do it. Let's just talk about our favorite jokes. Um, a couple of relatable ones. Uh, well, now I'm unemployed. How am I supposed to find adventure and excitement when I can't even cover my expenses? <laughs> it's like, damn, why is it tick me though? Um, the hardest laugh out of me. And I know this is a 1990s joke that would never pass today, but it killed me. Bipolar bear. <laughs> I have to save the word, the world. I have to get out there. But I just can't get out of bed this month. It's like so fucking <laughs> stupid. But I cried to pause, dude. I was watching Alert and I had to go <laughs> to another room and like pause to laugh. I was like, are you kidding? Bipolar Bear? Who writes this? Yeah. <laughs> and then my last big one was just the idea man being relatable where they're like, they're like, well, now that we've caught you, like, what was the plan all along? And they're like, oh, we thought we'd steal a lot of money and then we wouldn't have to work anymore. Like, what do you want? <laughs> it's like, fuck. Yeah. That's yeah. another one where you're like, do kids get that joke? Like, is that funny for kids? That's like right. great. Yeah, I uh, I really like that too. I loved all the superhero designs in this, all the all the wacky bad superheroes, and I love that the show throws them at you from minute one, yes. where. The tick is saying, yeah, I was in Reno at this superhero conference. talent show or conference or whatever. And yeah. here are all these random designs. And uh, but my favorite was <laughs> later in the episode when we're doing the montage of all the superheroes trying to go uh, intervene with like whatever the bad thing was that was happening with the, the bad guys. Um, 
well, there are two that I liked. One was the guy who's kind of your classic broad chested, big wacky hair. Yeah. Um, and he's trying to change into his superhero costume, but <laughs> the bathroom is occupied, so he can't. Um, or like somebody's in the phone booth, so he can't use it. I thought that was pretty funny. And then I really like the guy who is like the human bullet or whatever. So he gets <laughs> the cannon. And then the punchline of the episode is him just plinking off of the dam at the end. <laughs> it's over. Like, so, if you aim him so wrong, funny. then he becomes useless. It's just like, well, he's gone for a long yeah. time. Hilarious. Um, also, this is the most, um, this is like the silliest that Arthur is out of the three versions um, and kind of yeah. the least grounded, but he's, he's pretty funny. Um, I love the conversation that he has with his boss where his boss says, <laughs> <laughs> we all find this kind of rampant individuality disturbing. And then <laughs> Arthur's talking about um, uh, ever since I found this suit, I've felt strange new needs, mm. urges to like go be a superhero and whatever. Yeah. And then my favorite line of his is uh, he's walking down the sidewalk after having just lost his job. He's talking to himself and he's saying, okay, if I don't eat out and reverse my underwear to get an extra day, yeah. <laughs> it's then like the tick crashes down in front of him. Weirdly, again, weirdly relatable. Yeah. Not that I've ever done that, but I'm just kidding. Um, um, oh, another random bad superhero, Captain Lemming, who jumps off a <laughs> building or a cliff or something. And then you hear him after he's landed saying, come on, spine, work with me. <laughs> so, Mike, it's our kind of humor. It's just very yeah. like yeah. absurd. And it's kind of Simpsons-y in that way of like, ah! but like a little more Definitely. violent. And, you know, Definitely Simpsons the humor Simpsons. really, really worked for me in this. Just throughout, like topped up all 20 minutes of just laughter. Me too. Me too. Um that's the 1994 tick. It ends funny. Hey, we're we're a team mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. Um, we have the 2001 tick. Patty Warburton. Uh, I like Ar- Arthur's a little bit more serious in this one. Um, yep. I did feel the pacing slow down dramatically, but that's just because like live mm-hmm. animated to live action, uh, different sensibilities, different like things you're going for. Yeah. Not it's not to say that this was slow. It's just like it's got a lot of background gags. I will say a lot of like oh blink and you'll miss it. Yeah. Uh, little gags. Yeah, I um, think they do a, the the name of the game here is like okay, we can't just throw a bunch of gags at the wall, so we have to make sure that the things that we're doing are a little a little better developed and funnier. Yeah. And I think they land that pretty well because okay, we get rid of like all of these madcap, it's a world full of wacky superheroes. We set all that aside and instead it's like okay we're gonna get the tick costume to look a particular way which is very dorky with antenna that constantly move and express the ticks emotions um, <laughs> I love that and then they make this concerted effort to shrink down the superhero cast to just okay we're gonna have the justice league parody people instead yeah. of deflator mouse his name is gonna be batman well and we're gonna do that um which is part of the humor I was talking about. That's just like, this isn't okay, but it's pretty funny. Um, yeah, exactly. And then um, Captain Liberty is her new yep. name, right? Yeah. Um, Captain Liberty. And we're going to figure out what their deal is because their deal was very underdeveloped yes. in the 94 in the version. Or yeah, in the old um, one. Yeah. So I thought that was a welcome change. And then they were like, Okay, this whole plot with the idea men, we're gonna just make it a thing where a Soviet robot's trying to kill Jimmy Carter. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's, that's right. That's good. That's a good. Oh, I didn't read the summary of this one, by the way. You just said it though. There's the oh, tick. Sorry. There's the R. Sorry, no, yeah. it's fine. I forgot to. Uh, Throughout the Red Scare, a robot made in the '70s by the Soviet Union to program to destroy then U.S. President Jimmy Carter, who is still alive, obviously, and tries to target him. It's just like a perfect low level like i don't know what superhero to throw at this just throw the tick i guess sure uh-huh. like i've been playing a lot of the ps5 spider-man 2 game and it's always interesting being like acknowledging the existence of the avengers in a world where you're playing a spider-man because like they can't help because they do bigger stuff than this so they have to constantly justify why the avengers aren't around but in this it's uh-huh. like yeah that's about on the tier of 
like problem that like one decent superhero could probably handle <laughs> right. punch a robot get into a fight yeah. in an elevator which was hilarious yeah uh it looks so weird i can't get over how weird the show looks like the tick suit looks bad but good at the same time because mm-hmm. it's just a body I don't know suit how, with muscles i don't know how they did it but like this looks ageless it looks yeah. so bad and dated in the exact right way. Well, I don't think it's CG. I think that's why it looks ageless. There is CG no, but in I mean, it. Like, like, you know, superhero movies from this time period I see. look dated. Like when you watch X-Men, the X-Men movies from around this time, they're wearing their little leather suits. It's like, okay, that looks old. Yeah, yeah. But there's something about the tone that this show has the like kind of heightened campiness of it the fact that it's embracing how shitty it looks that makes it look exactly right Uh and i just found that impressive like it looks more ageless than the 2016 tick to me big time oh my god that's so true that's so true i think that's a barry sonnenfeld touch honestly and like his crew because like Uh men in black doesn't look old you know the character like the cg definitely does but yeah i this feels timeless like the diner they're in at the end the costumes the city it's mm-hmm. all just like very generic enough that you're like yeah this like, takes place in the modern era mm-hmm. and no one has like cell phones or anything so there's no like technology to kind of judge that by i'm sure if they ever did an episode about the internet then it would be like ooh, this feels crusty but no definitely in the look and feel of it it, it feels ageless which is awesome yeah um, any standout jokes or moments from this? Uh, Christopher Lloyd was Arthur's boss, which was not a cameo that I expected, but I enjoyed it. Of course, I love seeing Oth's Christopher Lloyd. I thought David Burke as Arthur was uh, very compelling. I like the yeah. other thing that I liked that was an edit here in this version was Arthur is a lot more grounded, and yes. the emotional arc of the episode is his, um, and it's about like there's this thing that i think i want i'm not sure what it means to me i'm gonna go out there and try it nah it kind of sucks these superheroes suck Uh but also there's good work to be done and i want to be a part of it um and i like that he instead of the tick like flinging him the way that he did in the cartoon it's arthur's choice to be like i have wings and i can save jimmy carter exactly um so i like that um, I really enjoy that every single one of these pilots has some version of the gag where the tick comes home to Arthur's apartment <laughs> and thinks that it's a superhero lair and starts breaking stuff. Um, the twenty sixteen that's exactly version, from the comic, right? That has to be exactly from. It, yeah, it must. It must be the twenty sixteen version does like the briefest version of it. Yeah, but um, it, it, in this version it was fun to see it in live action where he's like ripping the lamp off the wall and there's sparks and stuff and a lot, a lot of good uh, kind of physical humor there um i had some other gags patrick warburton is perfect casting by the way for yes, this he character is. when i saw the animated version immediately i thought oh, okay patrick warburton's gonna be able to play this guy no problem yep and he's handing it up yeah he delivers lines like this so well when he goes to save arthur and he says i sure would like a slice of your righteous combat pie (laughs) (laughs) so funny um it's very different from his voice his other voice work too like mm. you know i always have my, my immediate um memory my, my, my patrick over and pull is is joe from family guy right that's always the like hey uh-huh. Peter, um which is a voice right. that i love doing hey Peter. but like right. he's not just that's like from the back of the throat he's trying to be like a rhode islandy guy this is like i'm trying to be a superhero and like you know projecting a lot more which I, I think yeah. is great. I think this performance is stellar. I, agree. Um, I, I was going to say, I, I, you were talking earlier, this is definitely my favorite Arthur of all three. Believable, has an arc, lovable, this is a little bit cute. Like, it just, uh-huh. st- 10 out of 10 Arthur casting here. Casting in general. Yeah. Nestor Carbonell as Batmanuel, who uh, uh-huh. when we eventually do Lost Chats, you'll be like, oh, Nestor Carbonell. Um, that was really funny, even though, again, that joke would not slide today. It would, uh-huh. be, it would, it would feel a little bit too racist. Uh-huh. Even though it's like just like yeah, it is the like sex obsessed thing is definitely racist, but the rest of it's like just set dressing, like character dressing. It's weird. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
um and also the sex sexual stuff between him and uh it's a lot them. <laughs> it's a lot dude i appreciate that you're trying to do something to like make their relationship more interesting but it's a lot yeah um but and it, and it made it this overall this this adaptation manages to still be funny and weird and kinetic the way the cartoon is like i think it's a great ad- attempt at adapting that without just doing exactly it yeah um pace is a little bit slower like i said but ultimately these performances pull me in a lot more like empathy wise yeah and again that moment at the end where the tick is like i need you i was like oh my god i love you i love this pairing so much um i hope they don't do anything weird with it looks the side of camera and then we have the tick 2016 uh which was a amazon prime series that had one season and starred peter serafinowitz as the tick it had two seasons, uh, it had two seasons. Mm-hmm. good for them this uh in this episode did you already do the written directed by yeah just do the summary in a world where superheroes and supervillains are real Unassuming office temp Arthur is traumatized by the supervillain The Terror, having watched his actions lead to the death of his father when he was a young boy. As an adult, Arthur becomes a sort of vigilante of sorts, unsuccessful through most of his life, almost gets fired multiple times, and uh, he is assisted in some ways by a mysterious superhero named The Tick, who may or may not be inside his head. Uh, I totally, one million percent understand how you get here. You're making a tick in yes. 2016. Yes. You're not just going to do it again. I get that. Right. But now. You can't with, do it again. You no, can't you just do it again. You can't just do a live action one either because they already did that and people liked it. You know, it's a cult classic. Uh, So what do you do? Well, let's like put our spin on it. People like dark reimaginings. I, I like a, a, an occasional dark reimagining. This is freaking bleak, man. This is like Arthur at his worst, just like failing at life. We're talking over and over again about his like psychosis and his medication problems. And mm-hmm. I really dislike the trend of like, you know, mental health being treated as a thing where like if you take your pills, you become normal. And if you don't, then mm-hmm. you start seeing magical things. Um, yeah. I'm really curious how that can play out in this. But this is like you wrote new tick lore is dropping right now because it's like <laughs> instead of just like the tick exists. That's how the tick starts in both 94 and 01. This is yeah. like, well, the tick exists because Arthur was traumatized when he saw his father get crushed by a space by a ship full of syphilis, which is so edgy, dude. A ship full of <laughs> come on. By a monster called the Terror, who's basically like the like evil Joker, like the dark Joker. And uh-huh. he comes up to him and he's like, Hey, uh, you, you fucking suck, kid, you're useless. So he's traumatized, he grows up being afraid of superheroes and being super powered, but he still wants to and wants to fight crime, but nobody else is doing it, and he feels a conspiracy with the mob, and it's like, What, dude? What? I, I don't know. Am I being too negative? How did you feel about this? It seems like maybe you were a little more positive than I was. Uh no, I agree with you. <laughs> okay, great. It's yeah. I think my issue with this is you know they're trying they're trying to do like you're describing a tick for 2016 where the landscape of superhero media has changed drastically yes. and you can't like we're saying you can't just do the kind of spoof of Adam West stuff because then you're not really saying something or making a point about superhero media i think the problem is like by this point in 2016 superhero media has already become so much of a nothing that if you try too hard to like take on some of its tropes to lampoon them, you become a bit of a nothing in the process. And yeah. it's hard for me to tell like how much of this is we're poking fun and making this like an unnecessarily bleak, grim version, which I see in moments where the terror comes up to Kid Arthur and like knocks his ice cream to the ground and you say okay this is a joke we're making yeah. fun of origin story movies uh-huh. but then you like make me question a little too much is the tick in his head peter serafinowitz is doing this like very i don't know like dramatic take on the tick like he's a little scary yeah and i can't tell how funny it's supposed to be it's still kind of funny but i don't know like the tone is just so hard to to get and you know kudos to them for trying because now we're getting all of the superhero media that's like 
we're going to spoof superheroes. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to make them cuss and fucking kill. And yeah. Isn't yeah. that a thing? Blah. And instead, the Tick 2016 is trying to do something different to poke fun at the genre, but it's just not like clear enough is my yeah. problem. So I enjoyed it. I found it a fascinating third beat of this experience that we were having. But it, it there's it's not clicking is the problem. Yeah. Um it's really yeah, not. So that, that's my thought on it. A couple of other dark superhero things from this the twenty tens, um, or like dark reimaginings. Watchmen, both the O nine movie movie and then the HBO series as like a we know what you know and we're playing with it in an interesting way. Like this is kind of also a reboot that's like assumes you know what the original material is. Um, I guess like Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy is kind of like this. Um, the comparison I actually had that I know you haven't watched, but I found it interesting was uh, Venture Brothers, which is a show about what happens when characters from Johnny Quest grow up and have right. to live in the world. And like that show works really well because it takes its premise very seriously and finds comedy and levity within the seriousness. Um, but it leans way harder into the comedy. But yeah, like I see Sarah Fenowitz and I'm like creeped out. It doesn't help that the costume is really creepy. Like it looks off. And like, I'm compelled by that from like an artistic standpoint. Like, like, oh, they did a dark tick. Like, what does that actually look like? But mm. like they do you, I'm, this is mean. I'm going to say something mean right now, you guys. They do like YouTube parodies of like with stuff like this, where it's like, what if we did the dark Powerpuff Girls and they have drug addictions? It's like a couple steps above doing that. Mm -hmm. This is my ultimate takeaway from 2016 Tick. It's like, yeah. if that's really what you're going to do, it's like Arthur has a, a TIC Tick because of his like neuroses <laughs> and his, his mental health issues. Then like, oh boy, do I want to watch this? Because again, like there's a joy in seeing um, Patrick Warburton or the 90s Tick like break into a door he's so funny he's doing stuff he's breaking shit but when a tick to 20 when this sarah Fenowitz's tick comes in i'm like uh oh this is weird is he good for arthur is this a bad thing that he's here yeah I just right. uh, and, and like again all of this sounds great in a board meeting but i am not a 16 year old boy i i don't need i don't need my my shit to get darker i need my shit to actually get lighter uh and mm. that's how i really came out of this was like I want to forget that this existed. <laughs> and like, that's me again, mean, I know, but I just don't want to think about the tick 2016. And I maybe I'm curious, like, let's look this up. You know, what did people think of the tick 2016? It got, it got some pretty good reviews. This is like a 4.8. Okay. I'd be interested five. to see where it goes. I, I think there's some gas in the tank here. The, the pilot's just weird, especially since you, especially after you watch, the other two yes this is a so. bad way to get into the tick also this is clearly yeah. like the tick 301 201 <laughs> yeah this is the advanced advanced course in the tick so i i was thinking about that as well like i could just yeah. not do this one for now maybe down the line if i've watched a bunch more of it i'd be like okay i want to see how you how you muck this character up yeah well i think it's time for us to take a little break ski before yes, we come sir. back figure out which of these shows we're gonna watch for more of Oh, I'm excited. Okay. I think I've got my pick. I think I'm ready to duke it out. Okay. I I have no clue. Okay, <laughs> so, great. so here we go. We'll be right back with uh, our decision. Welcome back to Couch Madness. In the second half of our episode, we will be discussing the winner and picking the winner. And this, we're going to make it. It's going to have a winner at the end of this. Only one show may exit. And by that, I mean one show. So not only are we picking between the tick and six feet under, we are picking between the tick, the tick, and the tick. Um, <laughs> and six feet under. So... Uh -huh. Uh, how do we do this? Do we start with opening remarks? What's the? How, we haven't done this in like six uh, months. I think we got to figure out the tick first, which tick it is. Uh -huh. The reason we watched multiple ticks is because there wasn't clarity. This is my fault. There wasn't clarity on the initial form. 
and different people who were tick enthusiasts were enthusiastic about different ticks. So right. that's why we felt like we should watch them all. Obviously, 2016 is not, well, not obviously, but 2016 it's out. It's is out. not it. No. Right? It's out. Um, correct. Correct. Now, let me propose something to you, and you okay. tell me what you think. I think the tick 2001 automatically is a 13 under 13 show. For folks who don't know, 13 under 13, that's the season where we watch shows that uh, were canceled before they aired 13 episodes. I think The Tick would be great for that. It would be fun. It's a cult classic. It's good, but it's also like super canceled. And, you know, that would actually be kind of a, a, a fun show for that. Because I think we've watched a bunch of shows that were like, they're canceled because they weren't very good. And this would be an example of, ah, oh, it was canceled too soon. So yeah. I, I think, and I think also it would feel kind of silly if like the winner of Couch Madness was shorter than all, the process that led to <laughs> it. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I, I think from this point forward, we should be considering Six Feet Under compared to the 1994 cartoon with Correct. the knowledge that the 2001 tick will be covered in the future of chats whenever we want to return to 13 under 13. Yes, that's certainly true. So congratulations okay. technically for the tech 2001 for getting out. You escaped the <laughs> our, boundaries. our first winner of couch madness. Correct. You made it by default. All right. Uh, Great. This actually makes it harder. Um, oh, Oh, <laughs> tell me why. Tell me, tell me why were well, you going to just... pick 2000 tech 2001? Probably, yeah. These um, these both have merit, right? Ninety four tick and six feet under. Um, uh -huh. our first second is called our first part of decision time is gut checks, right? Yeah. So my gut check. Oh, let me just rub my tummy for a little bit. I just had some peanut butter pretzels, so it's very full. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, how many episodes? I mean, you is can disagree. You can disagree with everything I said. We could consider two thousand one. No, I think because I want to cover it. I think it's fair, it, and it should be a 13 under 30. Oh, okay. the Tick 94 is 36 episodes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have my gut check. Okay. Do we say? Yeah, we say the gut check, right? Yeah, it's the Tick 1994. Uh, this is tough. Gut check, gut check. Just gut check. Don't overthink it. Uh, you're you're rather, about to overthink it. So. <laughs> I'd rather watch Tick 1994, but I would rather do more chats content around six feet under. So my gut check is six feet under. Okay. This is great. That means we have a conversation to have here. We're not just going to, this is not a sweep. Yeah. Uh, so we have a method. Um, yeah. Our method is, method. can you describe our method for folks? Yeah. I came up with some words that rhyme and there's 16 of them, just like six, this is season 16, sweet 16, that kind of thing. So we're going to name each category. There's kind of a prompting question. And each one will go to one of these two shows, which is not necessarily what decides the winner, but it'll help us structure the deliberation process. Um, so we shall start with the moments of these episodes, the memes, schemes, screams, and themes. So first off, memes, which had more moments of ironic or semi-ironic silliness. That's kind of a tough call. Because one of them is, is very earnestly silly, and the other one has the ironic silly. Yeah. But I guess this is the Tick 94. Yeah. Can I sneak in a, another listener question, by the way? I forgot to ask earlier. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sorry. Listener questions. Yeah. I think this will help us. I think this will help us here. Yeah. This is from May Louise. Sorry for not answering this earlier, May Louise, but here it is. You and Magellan, I love that these are aimed at me, have been tasked, or it's you and yourself, have been tasked with coordinating a funeral at the Six Feet Under funeral home. What do y'all do? What do you do uh... for a funeral? I'm thinking live band. Uh -huh. Is it my funeral? Because it's gonna go. Cra it's gonna go dummy stupid. Um, I want my funeral to be a freaking party. Do you? Yeah. Why not? I always thought I did, but I kind of want people to be a little sad. Yeah. I died. People Aren't you will sad be sad. About it? Yeah, people will be sad when you die. Obviously. Cry about it. Cry about it. <laughs> Finish it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I would do, I would do some like live music. I would have booze. I would basically invite mm -hmm. all my friends who have never met each other and just like see what the dynamic is. And then mm -hmm. I would seal the doors to the 1600 funeral home and trap them in there for 24 hours together. Yeah. That'd be my final, the Joker's trick, if you will. I think that's what I would do. And I hope that the, the 1600 family, we need to learn their last names. 
um i think i would they would love that they would be totally fine with me mm. doing a sort of the game but for my doubt at my own death mm. i think my issue with uh the kind of funeral uh service depicted in the show is like i would have a and i have had a real hard time like making conversation with people at these sorts of things uh-huh. like what do you what do you talk about so I would just do sort of your standard funeral type thing, but have a lot of a lot of coffee table books. <laughs> <laughs> some like D and D, like uh, board games. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of that. Some like you know gourds of the northeast or something. Like oh, this is kind of cool. Pump different pumpkin varietals. <laughs> Do you see this book, Meg? Um, Meg. You know that kind of thing. So just just a little more stuff to talk about. I think is really what people need i dig that i actually think that's very sweet thank you Interesting. Now right, let's get back to funerals. our process oh wait what <sighs> yeah now that we've thought about funerals let's talk more about killing one of these shows i felt bad about interrupting you but now i wish i did yeah go ahead <laughs> okay the schemes which one had more moments of intrigue and plot movement this is impossible who could ever say it's six feet under? That's the slam. Yeah, dunk. I guess it's, I guess it's six feet under. There is technically intrigue, but there's no plot movement in the dick. It's just gonna be that show. Yeah, it's just intriguing. Yeah, exactly. Oh, here's an exciting question. Which had more? This is screams. Which had more moments of excitement and surprise? I'd give that to six feet under. I think. Why? What's intri- What's exciting? Surprising? Um, I think like. Oh my god, my dad's ghost is here while I'm trying to. Yeah. Work on his body. Yeah. Like that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. fuck, I'm smoking crystal meth. I'm yeah. going to throw stuff at you in the grocery store. Mm-hmm. Uh, that kind of thing. Okay, I'll give it to it. 6FU. I love calling it 6FU, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? Uh, themes, which had more moments addressing what the show is about. That's six feet under, also. It's all entirely about what it's about. It's only all ever about that. <laughs> it's only about what it's about. Okay, next we're talking about characters. We're talking about the clunks, honks, junks, and punks. Clunks, which had characters that were dorkier in a fun way. Arthur, clunks, the tick. Yeah, the tick. The ticks got the clunks. The, the ticks got the clunks. There's no nerd. That's the problem with Six Feet Under. There's no nerds. You wouldn't call Michael C. Hulk's character a nerd? Not really. Maybe mm. if he, I need him to be like annoyingly into pop culture. I need like Seth from uh, <laughs> the OC. I need like a just a shit heel. <laughs> I don't give a story. Hunks, which had characters that were hotter in a fun way. Three, two, one. The, the tick. tick. Yes. <laughs> I mean, look at the tick. He's literally yeah. made of muscle. Yeah. Junks, which had characters that were more eccentric in a fun way. Three, two, one. The tick. The tick. Yeah, the tick might sweep this category right now. Well, well. And punks, which had characters that were more rebellious in a fun way. I would actually give this to Six Feet Under. Six Feet Under actually takes that, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the Claire-Nate relationship is actually pretty fun, and I want to see it develop more. Yeah, me too. Me too. Because I like that vibe of, like, you know, we both get along because we hate we're so mad at our family. Yeah. But now we have to, like, be family to each other and figure that out and that's mm-hmm. gonna be a thing for us that, that's, that's tasty fun. that's tasty yeah. to me uh okay so what about the foundations that are being set here for the show to follow the clues crews hues and shoes clues which has more plot to explore and unravel over time uh which which one's got more more things for us to interesting this is very different from shoes which is coming up uh, yeah plot is technically six feet under right yeah i guess it's really it feels like neither of them should win this but i guess six feet under yeah just barely okay uh cruise which has more ensemble dynamics to dig into that's uh, six, six feet, feet under. under there's yeah. just more characters more people in the ensemble yeah there's more characters who matter i guess mm-hmm. right? which has more thematic range the hues I'm going to say the tick. I think the tick has a bigger palette. Okay. You don't yeah. Agree with well, no, I think that it's interesting because we often think about thematic range in terms of like drama to comedy, but I think the tick has a dramatic range, has a thematic range in terms of like 
silly to sincere, uh, mm -hmm. which is a slightly different spectrum. But uh, I'll vibe with that. I'll vibe with that. Shoes, which has more mileage from its base premise. Which one could walk further with what it's shown us here? The tick. The tick, yeah. I think that's I the biggest problem with Six, six Feet Under is it has no shoes. Yeah. But we don't feel like it Fair has foot. shoes yet. We haven't seen the shoes. Okay, adornments. The, these little extra bits here. The fits, hits, its, and wits. <laughs> fits, which had better use of costumes and props. The tick. Yeah, the tick. Great costumes. I like the way the different shows use Arthur's goggles. Like, whether they're, like, a cool secret accessory or they're just a thing that's part of his eyes like they are in the cartoon. Yeah, I agree. Um, what about the hits, which had better use of music? I mean, this is Six Feet Under, right? It, the Tick does have a great theme song, but... It had an awesome theme song. Yeah, that's kind of what it has going for it. It's, which makes better use of the cast and the guests. I think that's... Uh, uh, I think that's Six Feet Under. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dang, if this was 2001 Tick, I'd give it to Tick. Uh, yes. And then wits, which makes better use of the script and writing. I would argue that this is the tick. Yes, I love it when we agree. agree good, good, good. Because okay, it's tight. Tabulate. It does what it's doing. This is close. Five, six, it seems close. Seven, eight to eight. It's tied. Oh my god. <laughs> well, we got to decide then. We got to decide. Talk um, me through your process. What are you feeling? What's, what's your heart say? I'm sitting back. This is the part of the podcast where I always remember I used to like sit back and okay, talk me through it. This is this is the thing that I'm running into every time we do a deliberation for Cabin <laughs> Madness, which is like, yeah. I feel like the question of which one I want to watch episode two of is a different question than which one do I want to chat, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because I feel more ready and excited to chat the tick, mm -hmm. but I feel well, I like two of a stronger under. need to see episode two of Six Feet Under to get it like i i get the tick 94 it's not gonna do something in episode two that's wildly different and also to be honest like i don't know how discussable it is because like you correctly pointed out us talking about the show is us saying okay here are my favorite jokes <laughs> and then that's what it was and it was mm -hmm. fun but like what's the podcast there i don't think the tick 94 is gonna win um yeah. the the bracket <laughs> Zena's uh, on there. <laughs> what did you say? I said you Zena's say? on there. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Um, yeah. It Zena just smokes the tick a hundred percent. There is no tick, not even two thousand one tick. Zena like cooks them all. Anyway. Smash Brothers announcer. No contest. <laughs> no. <laughs> um. So I don't know. And I also okay. feel bad about these shows that we like piloted and then we bring them back. And then it's like, yeah, but uh, you just don't quite cut it for us to watch more of you. Think about it. And like, I, go I ahead. Know. I have a point about that. I have a point about that. Well, go ahead. Just, and out of all of those ones that we've piloted before, Misfits, Korra, Veronica Mars, Six Feet Under is the one that I feel the most bad about not getting to episode two. Because it's, Agreed. I like it the most out of that set. Um so what's can i say something crazy say i'm gonna anymore. say something so crazy uh, I, lo I love it when we get to this exact moment <laughs> in this episode and you just go off the deep end what is it i've been thinking about texting an ex recently and uh <laughs> hold on hold on don't run away which will come back i'm grabbing you by the shirt collar come the i'm here i'm not leaving when we watched 1600 in 2021, it felt like the right moment. Sometimes you come back to something and you say, oh, maybe not right now, but someday. And I think maybe not literally tonight I'm not in the mood to watch Six Feet Under, but I will be in the mood. Like, I have these like, thoughts, too. It's the same thing with the ex where it's like there are friends of mine who are like, no, you shouldn't. No, maybe you should. And it's like, I need to decide. We need to decide this. The listeners mm. have told us that they like both shows, but they haven't really gone into much depth on like, which one do they want us to cover? And like mm. when people say like, oh, I actually don't like season five of Six Feet Under as much as everyone else. That's actually okay with me. I don't need a perfect show. We watched The Leftovers. I got my perfect show out of chats. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> JK. But like it's th sometimes this is not the right time or place. That doesn't mean that she's a bad person and that you can't be with her now. Maybe someday in the future. <laughs> I'm talking about six. I mean, the show. The show Six Feet Under. That's what I'm talking about. Uh -huh. <laughs> you want to talk after the pod <laughs> that's so funny hey! so 
that's my that's my point for that. I want to keep playing devil's advocate though. And yeah, um sure. you brought it to my attention that I'm talking with my hands oh, now if you no. can't tell. You oh, brought it no. to my attention before I'm that scared. we you struggled with with uh, Avatar the Last Chat Spender because like animated show consistently good can kind of be a difficult to talk about sometimes. I don't Yeah. I th- I I always want to vouch for us to try different things. So we fall into a rut. Yeah. That's how people get bored of us. That's how we get bored of doing this. Uh-huh. If the new thing is like, and like, let me, let me, let me sweeten the deal. Let me put a little bit extra thick sauce on there for you. <laughs> Girlfriend of the podcast, Amanda always tells us, Oh, she has told us before. She even said this during Trek chats. Like when Magellan has to watch a show, it's like a sacred thing. It's like, this is the only thing we're doing this weekend. That most happens with Star Trek because of the way uh-huh. that, you know, life works. With the tick, it's like, boom, 40 minutes, you're done for the week. You're done. 20, 20 <laughs> minutes a, of just rapid What a terrible fire. argument. <laughs> what? I mean, no, no, no. It's good. I'm just saying, like, uh, in a public forum. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, in a public forum, you. it'll make your girlfriend happy is an insane thing to say. <laughs> no, let me tell you on doing less work for our podcast. Is kinda, but no, you're no, right. No, no, and less no. Prep right. Work, less prep work. Less but prep as a work, result, it would encourage us to do more in episode or pre pot pre production uh, prep, which would be like reading about the reading some of the comics, uh, reading mm-hmm. production notes, reading trivia about the show, looking at other tick podcasters. Like I'm sure there's other tick content out there. Yeah, true, true. There's a wider scope of things for us to do with the tick, whereas Six Feet Under is like it's a show that we would watch and finish. True. So I've given my points for both, and I'm sweating now from getting so intense there. So I'm gonna cool down a little bit. And stop talking okay. with my hands so much and mm-hmm. let you say your stuff. Um, yeah. I think I think it's the tick. I think I'm there. Uh I like what you were saying about it's okay for it to not be the right time for six feet under. Because <laughs> that's what I was talking about. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Just gonna move mm. past <laughs> all the other stuff. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, because it. You're right. It doesn't feel like the right time. I might just watch episode two of Six Feet Under soon to get yeah. it and to answer that question for myself. But Six Feet Under's not beating Xena. It's not beating Stargate for me. It's not. You know. It's not clearing a lot of the other shows that are on here. So like we might as well watch a fun cartoon <laughs> and, and put that up against stuff and see how it does. Um, That's a good point. That's a great point. So I'm, I'm down for the tick. I, I'm, I'm there. I'm into it. Let's, let's do the tick. Yeah. 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 We'll have so many guests. Like think about better off Ted. I have so many, and it's on YouTube uh, and Hulu. I can get, we can get anybody we want to watch the tick with us and, and you don't need any preamble. You could just mm-hmm. watch it. Hey, this is the tick. What do you think it was funny? What'd you like about it? Oh, I love True. this. I'm starting True. to sell myself on it more and more. Yeah, I did. I was thinking about our better off Ted coverage when you were talking about short episodes. That uh-huh. season was nice to have like much less prep time, but also like you're saying, it was way more accessible to bring people on and see what they think about it and stuff. Cause then we could have, instead of the show having to provide us with like new material we could just kind of ask people like, "Hey, what do you think about superheroes?" And also, "What's up with this yeah. this tick, huh?" So, Ooh, yeah. Can I sell you? Can I before we make our final pick? Can I sell you actually on Six Feet Under one more time? <laughs> I need to make this. A- <laughs> I don't want it to be okay. easy. I, we gotta have fun with this, yeah, okay? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. What are you gonna I'm gonna say? just say a couple of things that are plot points in Six Feet Under that will not be spoilers, really. Well, they're kind of spoilers, okay. but they're like fun. Okay. Claire at one point exper- explores lesbianism. <laughs> okay. There is an episode about. There's a paintball episode. <laughs> I'm six feet under. You're unselling me. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Come back, come back. Rain Wilson is in an episode in season three. Mm, I'm, I, I'm walking out the door. I learned recently that Rain Wilson is like super spiritual. It's very interesting. He's on a podcast about spirituality. Huh. Uh, I'm just looking at best episodes of six feet under. That one's called Bomb Shelter. These are weird. Oh, okay, I've run out of. I've run, oh, James Cromwell's in this show. We love James Cromwell. He's the he's the official dad of of Chad's television podcast. Mm-hmm. At least for now, until I remember another guy who we said was our dad. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, final picks. Put them in the chat. Oh my God, Allison Hannigan's in six feet under. Okay, final picks in the chat. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> 
the way we do this is Majan and I have a Discord chat. That's how we're talking to each other, and we put it in the text chat. And when I say go, we're going to both hit send on our answer, and that is how we decide. Okay? Are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. Three, two, one, go. What? <laughs> what are you talking about? Uh, I put the wrong show in. Sorry. That's the one I meant to put in. <laughs> <laughs> you just did that for the meme. Come no, I on. forgot. No, I totally forgot which one I was supposed okay. to do. Okay. We, we both put the tick down. I wrote. I literally wrote six hundred by wholly by accident. Don't make fun of me. Be nice I, to me. I almost wrote it by accident. Yeah, if, see, we both, if we had both, if we had both, oh my god, by accident, we would have had to do it. Imagine getting married to someone by accident. That's what that would have felt like. Yeah. Uh, congratulations to the Tick nineteen ninety four. We're gonna get Ben Edlin on the podcast to talk about only supernatural and nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> only, only niche suburban Massachusetts content. Oh, yeah. Wait, I'll send some emails. Um, if this wins, how about that? Okay. The tick okay. makes it to round two. I will update the challenge, which again you can find in the. Oh wait, I can't update it yet because it'll spoil the season for people. I'll yeah, update no, it on no. Sunday. Cool. Congratulations to the tick. A good showing, honestly. You had three chances. And two uh-huh. of them got got slam dunked out of existence. One of them into the future, and one of them into the ne- the never dimension. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, congrats, congrats. If we wa- if we watch the cartoon, we have to do like a Prisoner 09, you know, for 2016 or whatever, or for what? Like a a Prisoner 09 type of episode for the Tick 2016. Oh, if we must, yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. yeah, you're right. We'll enjoy it enough at that point that we'll be like, I can't wait for another tick thing. And then be like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, next time we're continuing the couch madness with uh, our next matchup. Next time it is our 10 seed Sequest DSV against our 7 seed Battlestar Galactica. So battle of the ship shows but different different kinds of ships both shows that we've piloted before i think it'll be an intriguing discussion about the direction in which we want to take this season Mm -hmm. um from a tonal perspective so join us for that next time around do we decide which pilots we're watching um these are both 90 minute pilots yeah i think we just gotta we're just gonna watch them both grin and bear it okay I think so. I've watched the Battlestar Galactic Pilot so many times I could do it in my sleep now. Uh, <laughs> the Sequest Pilot, I'm legit excited to watch again. I remember having a good time with it. Especially now that I know when it gets to be fun. Because the first like 20 minutes of it, you're like, wait, this is not fun. Do this I need like to a... learn stuff? And then they're like, no. No, no, no. There's a talking dolphin. <laughs> or no, there's like a smart dolphin or a psychic dolphin. <laughs> all right. Even better. Even Way better. better. Okay. Uh, so I think we're having a guest on that for that episode. Is that correct? I believe so. Yeah. In on Croyab. Great. Well, stay tuned for Battlestar Galactica and Sequest DSV. Uh, and for now, I have to ask him, John, where can people find you on the internet? You can find me on another podcast that I do with my friend Justin called Super Smash Echoes, where we discuss uh, video games related to the Super Smash Brothers franchise. Super Smash Echoes, check it out. And you can also read some of my writing on notthatmagellan.substack.com. Alan, what about you? You can hear me on a couple podcasts on scanlinemedia.com, including The Creature Quorum, where my friend Six and I talk about monsters from Monster Hunter and Pokemon, as well as The Garnet Wager, which is a semi-regular podcast that incorporates elements of a radio drama, a tabletop podcast, and a reality game show review show. Um, that's The Garnet Wager. That's all on Scanline Media. You can also hear me every other month on Talking Marketing, which is a marketing podcast that I do for AMA Boston uh my next episode's coming out in january and it's really fun and we talk about tv really briefly in it so january 15th the next episode of talking marketing comes out look forward to it please Magellan, i believe it's your turn your turn for the plug zone this week sir okie dokie here i go if you'd like to get in touch with the show you can do so in a few different ways you can email us at chatspot at gmail.com with any questions comments concerns suggestions if you want to get on an episode if you have your own opinions on matchups if you have questions you want us to discuss uh, in future match matchups of course let us know there at our email uh, by the way also you can follow the challenge link in the description to see the bracket so that you can see which matchups are coming up in the future and what decisions have already been made you can also follow us at chatspot on twitter 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 uh, DM us there if you'd like to do so we are on youtube chats a television podcast 
And of course, we are all over the place. Uh, wherever you find podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, things like that, you can rate us and review us on whatever platforms those things happen. And that would be really helpful. Also, share the show with people who like TV or other stuff or like us, even if they haven't met us yet. They're probably out there. They just don't know that they're going to enjoy it. So help some people learn that. Now, if you want to support the show with money, okay, I got, okay. The, I got just the thing. What is it's it? called patreon.com slash chatspod. At a dollar a month and up, you can join our Discord and talk about stuff in there. At $3 a month and up, you get twice monthly bonus content. Sometimes that bonus content is us piloting potential future episodes of chats. So if this whole time you're like, ah, oh, they already talked about Six Feet Under. God, I wish I'd heard that two years ago. Well, guess what, Buster? Guess what, chum? If you'd just been a patron two years ago, you already would have heard it. You sounded so much like your mom right there. <laughs> I don't know why I, I thought that. To... I was cycling through like five different mom accents. Yeah, it was great. Uh, anyway, five dollars a month and up gets you thanked right here at the end of the episode. Speaking of my mom, our five dollar patrons include Arthur, Emrys, Felicia, Jen, Justin, Kyrie, Lee, Marcus, May Louise, my mom, Nick, and Pat of the brothers. Sorry, I I tried to not make it sound like Nick is my mom, and I made it sound more like Nick is my mom. John's mom, Nick. Magellan's mom. <laughs> Nick and Pat. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way not to make it sound like that. Of the Brothers of Infinite War. Uh, Noel, Six, and Stefan. Thank you, folks, for supporting the show. We really appreciate it. The other thing we appreciate is, uh, of course, uh, other plugs. I forgot there are other plugs. We have a website, chatspot.com. At Camilla Illustrator. Thank you so much for our podcast art. This is what I was going to segue into. Chatsums little suggestions to snack on between now and next time. We don't talk about the pickle in the fridge anymore, but we still talk about these little snack and pickles at the end of every episode. Alan, what's your chats? I still have the chats and the pickle pickles. Should I see if they're good? I'm scared. They're probably Not right fine. now. Okay, obviously. Um, I want to recommend a TV show because I can do that now. Um, I have been watching the wonderful Paramount Plus. I think Paramount Plus is where it's original. Or it's on Showtime. I don't know where it originally comes from. The mm -hmm. Curse, Nathan Fielder, Benny Safdie, Emma Stone in a cinema verite style, documentary style show about a couple who are trying to get an HGTV show off the ground in the middle of New Mexico and disaster strikes in a number of incredibly awkward and incredibly uncomfortable ways that may even hint at something more than realistic maybe even supernatural probably not though did you like uncut gems but you didn't want to feel like you're having a panic attack the whole time did you like uh nathan for you but you wanted him to show his butt at one point and to be married to emma stone did you want to fuse all of those different ideas into one new series with a little bit of like like surreal like almost twin peaksy kind of stuff the curse is your show it is so so good and i really struggle to recommend it to people who don't like uncomfortable stuff because like it makes me want to cringe out of my seat sometimes. Like, and by, and you mean like, okay, Alan, what do you mean by like cringe out of your seat? I'm saying like, there's a scene <laughs> where a funny thing happens between the couple that I won't get into. And because they were told by their network that they weren't funny enough, Emma Stone's character like fully pauses the funny moment and says, can we do that again? But I'm going to film it for my Instagram. And like the awkwardness of trying to recreate a genuine couple's moment. I'm talking stuff like that. And that's the tip of the iceberg. It's a really wonderful show. It's five episodes in out of, I think, a 10 episode season. So it's going to go somewhere weird soon. I really recommend getting on the train and watching The Curse. It's it's my current like TV obsession. Um, and at work, I've been watching a ton of YouTube. And I finally, I want to chat some this sort of new method. You know, months ago, Magellan said, you, you, you talked about a method you had for dwindling down your um your youtube watch later playlist which uh -huh. was basically deleting stuff that you didn't want to watch immediately if i'm remembering correctly or like what was the method there um i don't even remember it, it also worked for me at the time but now i'm kind of back into a hole so don't yeah no <laughs> i'm always listening to you. that's what i do for a living um my method has been to sort my youtube watch later by date published oldest and to just mm -hmm. treat it like a TV network. I don't get to pick what comes up next. My watch later mm -hmm. tells me what comes up next. Mm -hmm. I've been watching Ro Ramden's YouTube video essays like back to back to back to back for like a, a week now. I'm having a great uh -huh. time. And then I randomly will just get like, oh, here was a comedy skit that I never got actually came out a year ago. 
oh, here was a like short Cody Ko video that came out a year ago that I never watched. Just like like little things like that. It's led to me really like digging into and watching a bunch of like video essays that I never got to. Uh, I really, really loved, for example, that Defunct Land uh, Disney Channel theme episode. I thought that was freaking beautiful from last year. Yes, yeah, so good. One of his best, for sure. I'm going to get to the Wiggles one at some point, And then There's Epcot, Wiggles, yeah. the Wiggles Dark Ride. That's like from seven months ago. Oh, oh it's not about the Wiggles the show. It's about the, oh, the it's ride. About it. Oh, well, still. Yeah, still, for sure. Um, yeah, I love Defunct Land, and I love Roar Rimden, And so I'm like getting to discover content that I've always been like, eh, I'll get to it. I'm going to watch 20 minutes of Cody Co. rate watching people do a dating show. Because like, you just accept junk food in your life, and you forget that there's carbs. And protein <laughs> protein so uh, it's it's also weird just being like last thing about this it's weird being in last year's youtube videos because it's like oh uh, there's the dream face reveal controversy <laughs> like i don't care yeah. about this anymore this doesn't matter to my life but right yeah i'll watch and and it's also i i let myself delete stuff if i watch some of it and i'm like oh this is just isn't interesting i queued it up for a year and now that i'm watching it i'm like nope uh -huh. the only problem with this method is that about halfway through my watch later is the nine hour five nights at freddy's lore video which will <laughs> put a sharp stop to this project it's the fuck of the iceberg <laughs> yeah if i can get past that there's a ton of short stuff and then i get to watch like like dev limes again and like cody stuff and you know that mm -hmm. stuff i want the junk food i'll come back to junk food but i have to get through it yeah you get to come home having changed at that point <laughs> i will be a different person when i finish the <laughs> five nights at freddy's video Anyways, so my, my chat sims are The Curse and watching your YouTube watch later in chronological order. Nice. What about you, Majon? Well, I'm going to continue my brilliant plan of slowly parceling out chat sims from the weekend that I went to PAX Unplugged yeah. uh, by recommending to you two Reiner Knizia games that I played with the folks that I went to PAX, PAX Unplugged with. Um, and these were games that we sort of played like in the evening after things uh i kind of wound down for us we wanted to try out some games so the first is a game called lost cities it's the roll and write version of lost cities from 2021 um if you're not familiar with the roll and write genre you are familiar with the roll and write genre because you've played yahtzee that's a roll and write you roll and then you write and that's what lost cities is um, but Lost Cities is a little different because it's like you're rolling colors and numbers. I'm not going to explain the rules, but there's kind of like an interactivity component where basically when it's your turn, you roll and you pick the dice you want first, and then you leave the rest of the dice for everybody else to write on their thing. So it's kind of like I'm doing my own thing here, but I'm messing with other people. It's fun. I think it's it's nice, quick game. It's like takes 20 minutes or something to play. Um very small, portable Lost Cities. Recommend it. And then the other Reiner Knizia game that we played that I really enjoyed is called Modern Art. And essentially the way modern art works is you are, everybody's playing like uh, a curator at a museum. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of an auction game where you have like pieces of art from these different artists that you're trying to auction off. Um, and there's different kinds of auctions that you can engage in. Um, some of them are like highest bid takes it. Some of them are like, we're all going to go around and everybody only gets one bid. Some of them, it's like, it's a secret bid. Um, but you're auctioning off these pieces of art and it's this interesting mechanic where like the artist who sells the most art in that round, their art ends up being worth the most at the end of the round. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're trying to like auction stuff so that people will pay you for the art, but then people are trying to buy stuff that they're then going to try to make valuable later. So you can like money is fake and you're trying to trick people into spending their money in less optimal ways than how you spend your yeah. money. Um, I really enjoyed modern art. So if that's your kind of thing, if you like that kind of social play, negotiation deal making auctioning strategy math kind of thing um it's super fun i'd recommend it so this lost awesome Cities and modern modern art are my two recommendations shout out to board game geek by the way for having like video gameplay of all of their board games at yes. least most of them that i'm seeing board it's game really geek is, is great yeah great resource for this 
because I'm always like, if I look up modern art, I'm not going to find anything. But if I go modern <laughs> art on Board Game Geek, I'm like, oh, that's a great cover. And here's a guy playing it. Um, Groovy. I love that. And I can't wait for the inevitable PAX Unplugged uh, <laughs> short story essay that you're gonna write for the sub no i'm just kidding <laughs> so, <laughs> not signing up for right. anything oh man this was really fun man i feel like i'm back i feel like i'm home i feel safe and comfortable yeah, yeah. and i'm ready for bed so <laughs> me too thank you to magellan for being the tick to my arthur because you make me feel loved and important and thank you so much dear listener for listening to this episode of couch matters peace bye